job losses, record home foreclosures and devaluations, lost retirement savings. The mess we're in today did not begin on Wall Street. Long before the financial collapse, the dismantling of government regulation was well underway. This has been the greatest wealth transfer in the history, at least of um, American kind, if not mankind. This is class warfare. In a real life development dwarfing the most elaborate conspiracy fiction, all of these consequences are the end result of a brilliantly executed coup. Everyday human lives, the common dreams of people everywhere, were never a factor. All that mattered was profit. Who did it? How were they able to pull it off right before our eyes? This is the story of the biggest heist in American history. mother was born into the world of boom and bust, boom and bust, as it had been from 1794 until the Great Depression. Once upon a time, we knew in this country we had a Great Depression, and we had a stock market crash in 1929, followed by several years of 25% unemployment, of corporations declaring bankruptcy, of people in the streets on bread lines. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. In the depths of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt's New Deal put millions back to work, provided unemployment insurance, created Social Security, and made it easier for workers to join unions and bargain collectively. What FDR and that government had the balls to do was enact legislation that really took command of the Wall Street environment and said, you know what, you can't speculate with other people's money. Coming out of the Great Depression, just three laws fundamentally altered the course of America's history. The first one, FDIC insurance, make it safe to put money in banks. The second one, Glass-Steagall, try to separate the risk taking on Wall Street from uh, your local community bank. And the third one, uh, SEC regulations uh, provide some cops to watch the robbers. Out of that, what we got was 50 years of economic peace. No financial panics, no meltdowns. And during that 50 years, we built a strong and prosperous middle class in America. After World War II, the New Deal evolved into a great deal for the American people. Growing prosperity and social justice seemed to be everyone's destiny as the U.S. economy exploded into the greatest economic machine in history. There has there never, has been, never been, anything been anything like, the, like America the America of today. Of today. A, nation a nation so, so productive, productive that, the that the typical worker's, worker's family is able, is able to afford, afford conveniences, conveniences and luxuries, luxuries available, available only, only to the privileged, privileged few elsewhere. elsewhere. We had the home ownership rate in this country going from about 44% on the eve of World War II to 64% by the mid-60s. We had the blue-collar middle class, and entrepreneurs did beautifully. Corporate America did fine. The New Deal established that ordinary people had the right to protect themselves against corporate abuse. The early 70s expanded those safeguards with the creation of agencies like the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, whose mission was to protect workers. The Environmental Protection Agency was created to protect human health and the environment. 
Regulation is nothing more than the imposition of a set of rules to prevent the free market from behaving in a way which is contrary to the common good. A decision was reached by corporate America that working with unions, uh, working with government to improve the standard of living for all people was not the right thing to do. In 1971, corporate leaders began to orchestrate a detailed battle plan to eliminate any government policies that might stand between them and profits. The plan was laid out in an influential memo called Attack on American Free Enterprise System. Lewis Powell was a well-respected citizen of Richmond, Virginia. He was a corporate lawyer, a partner in a prestigious corporate law firm, and friends with uh, an executive at the Chamber of Commerce named Eugene Sidnor. And Sidnor asked his friend if he would draft a position statement that he could submit to the Chamber of Commerce that would then sort of form the framework for how to make the organization more able to confront what they thought was a growing threat to business interests. Powell's memo laid out a strategy to radically alter public perceptions, ensuring that big business interests would dominate public policy. Powell advocated a vast purge of liberal elements in society. He saw how corporate money could own the media and talk louder than organized labor and consumer protection groups. But for Powell, a future Supreme Court justice, the real end game was business control of law and politics. You see this memorandum bouncing from desk to desk, from uh, boardroom to boardroom around corporate America, uh, inspiring and inciting uh, business leaders to find a way to get involved and to join what they had already, many of them had already perceived to be a battle for the soul of America and a battle to save free enterprise. To make their point, the Chamber of Commerce created very clever advertising to influence public opinion. What can be, what done, can be done to repair, to repair the, strength the strength of the nation's of the economy, economy, economy and restore, and restore individual, individual freedom? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the recently formed Elite Business Roundtable, an exclusive club of CEOs, joined forces to lobby Congress and push their agenda with major campaign contributions. Their goal? To buy congressional votes to implement a corporate makeover of America. You had massive lobbying beginning in 76, 77, 78 for cutting taxes on rich people, trickle down economics, cut capital gains taxes, cut dividend taxes, cut income taxes, and the economy will flourish. Some of the Democrats start drinking the Kool-Aid along with the Republicans. Next, big business set its sights on the biggest threat to their bottom line, the wages and benefits of the American workforce, especially union members who, starting in the 1930s, had won bargaining power for wages, working conditions, and benefits. But instead of negotiation, big business wanted control. Lewis Powell, the Powell Memo. Businessmen should use their financial muscle to shape the politics of the country, nor should there be reluctance to penalize politically those who oppose it. By 1978, business outspent organized labor three to one to defeat a bill that would have made it easier for workers to join unions. This was a critical turning point, setting in motion the decline of organized labor as a major political force and the voice of working Americans. Douglas Frazier, president of the United Auto Workers, said in a magazine interview at the time, I believe leaders of the business community, with few exceptions, have chosen to wage a one-sided class war today in our country, a war against working people, the unemployed, the poor, the minorities, the very young and the very old, and even many in the middle class of our society. One of the geniuses of the right in the United States is they funded these 12 big Washington organizations, Heritage, Cato, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, organizations that range from quite principled Cato to complete shills, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. 
for the causes of their donors. Heirs to six of the largest family fortunes in the United States use their private foundations to fund organizations that would promote unregulated markets. One notable one would be uh, the role of Joseph Coors at the Heritage Foundation, who constantly cited the Powell Memo as one of the reasons that he was inspired to create a uh, conservative pro-business think tank uh, that he called Heritage. Well, Heritage is a conservative think tank, and if you read the back of our business cards, it says, building an America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. And that's Heritage's goals. Working in unison, the six families use their private foundations to shape business schools and manipulate the media. Most of all, they wanted to restructure government to serve their own interests. They're not think tanks. These are not academic research organizations. These are ideological marketing organizations. They're no different than the people who persuaded young men when I was a young man that we should put Brill Cream in our hair. You know, add grease to your hair. It'll make you attractive to the girls. These, these economic, economic royalists complain, complain that we, seek, that we to seek to overthrow the institutions, the institutions of America. Of America. What they what really, they really complain, of complain of is that we, is seek, that we take seek away, take their, away power. their power. Even in the Great Depression, when 25% of Americans were out of work, you had these apologists for free market fundamentalism argue against increased government spending, increased regulation, strengthening the hands of unions, a stronger safety net. The same thing is happening today. The motive was ideological, putting millions and millions of dollars into funding right-wing ideas factories. But then those ideas needed to get pushed out into the media. Well, the kind of narratives that Republicans have used and conservatives have used have come out of 40 years and tens of billions of dollars worth of efforts by uh, conservative think tanks uh, to try to develop just the right kind of words to use. Well, Republicans were the ones that pushed through President Bush's tax policy in 2001 that lowered the death tax. To the broad question of how it was that the right managed to get people who shouldn't have voted for them to vote for them uh, is, is obviously the million dollar question. But when it came to something like the estate tax, well, the, the way the, the law was originally written, no one was affected by the estate tax except the extremely rich. But of course, the way they talked about it, it was brilliant. Uh, and it's the most unfair tax there is. They've already paid taxes on this money when they made it. They paid capital gains taxes along the way. And here we are at death, and we're going to hit them again. When you say death tax, what you say, wait a minute, now they're taxing you for dying? For God's sakes, they tax me when I make the money. They tax me when I spend it. Now they're going to tax me for dying. No, th I've had enough. And what the Republicans understood was you test those kind of things until you find that kind of language that really resonates with people. My plan will give businesses tax incentives that result in plant expansion, greater output, and more jobs. It'll remove regulations that shoot up the cost of doing business. Strong creative leadership can restore America as the mightiest industrial nation on Earth. The time is now for Reagan. It all comes together in the election of 1980. Uh, where the right had built up this powerful political and financial and intellectual infrastructure, and it all comes together under Reagan. Reagan so by the time Reagan takes office, there is an army of policy wonks who have a whole game plan that can be put into effect very, very quickly to deregulate everything that hasn't been deregulated under Carter. America saw Ronald Reagan as someone trustworthy. As the host of television's General Electric Theater, his charm kept us from noticing that he was there to sell appliances. As president, Reagan's policies followed the Powell Memo script, serving the big business interests that financed his campaign. Heritage produced something first for the Reagan administration. And what this was was a catalog of how Heritage felt that government programs should be changed, reformed, eliminated, started, etc to best uh, meet conservative goals. The newly elected president handed out the Heritage Foundation's mandate for leadership to every member of his cabinet. For the next eight years, this anti-government policy guide drove the Reagan administration's makeover of federal government from protecting the public good into working for the rich and powerful.
Ronald Reagan is my hero. Why is he my hero? He gave us pride. He gave us loyalty. He gave us patriotism. He brought back our position in the world. He brought us out of darkness and into light. He cut taxes for those at the top. Instead of balancing the budget, he ran the biggest deficits in history. Then he presided over the passage of a series of tax increases on ordinary people, only he didn't call them that. The Washington Press Corps went along with the White House calling these revenue enhancements. Government is not government the solution, is not to, our the solution to our problem. Government is government the problem. Government is the problem. Was attacking government, attacking the institutions of government, and uh, trying to make it as a system that doesn't work. And uh, in, in reality, uh, rich folks don't need governments. They live in their own gated communities. They have their own security. They swim in their own swimming pools. They go to their own private schools. Rich people take care of themselves. The ideology of the free market that said that if we allowed them to just use their own creativity and be able to do what they want, that the wealth that they created would trickle down to create jobs and, and create consumer goods and, and make America an even richer and more prosperous society than it was. Well, all that was beautiful theory. You either believe in it or you don't. The whole idea of a free market is a myth to begin with. Markets are structured based on laws, and the real issue is who the structure benefits. And there's just no question that uh, when Ronald Reagan came in, the target of Reaganomics was the labor movement. One of his first acts was to destroy the uh, air traffic controllers, which was a signal to all American businesses that it was open season on unions. They are in violation they of the law. They are in violation of the law. And if they do not report and if they for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their they jobs, forfeited their and, jobs, forfeited their and, jobs will be terminated. and will be terminated. They understand that it's not just about labor supporting the interests of members of labor unions, but it has been the labor movement that has supported the interests of all workers. You wouldn't have Social Security. You wouldn't have unemployment compensation. You wouldn't have Medicare. You wouldn't have all of these things, which are not just for labor union members. As the bumper sticker says, they are the people who brought you the weekend. He was able to pull off an ideological counter-revolution. And by the time he was over, uh, most of the New Deal had been dismantled. While Reagan was breaking unions and demolishing regulations, he also convinced Congress in 1981 to pass his Economic Recovery Tax Act, cutting the top tax brackets by nearly a third, but raising taxes on the middle class. By dramatically increasing the Social Security tax, as recommended by Alan Greenspan to Ronald Reagan, we shifted the burden of government so that today, 70-some percent of Americans pay a heavier share of their income in Social Security and Medicare taxes than they do in income taxes. And we push the burden down. At the same time, at the very, very top, we radically cut taxes so that the 1,000 richest men, women, and children in America face an effective total federal tax rate, Social Security and income taxes, about 17 cents on the dollar, and their average income is $263 million. After decades of lobbying driven by corporate money, the tax code is now full of loopholes and special deals that help big business avoid paying its fair share. To avoid paying taxes, U.S. corporations have stashed more than $1.5 trillion in offshore accounts. Corporations only pay 13% of the federal budget's revenues. Out of two and a half trillion dollars, corporations only pay 13%. So I just want to list some 10, the 10 worst corporate tax avoiders. ExxonMobil, largest oil company in the world, made 19 billion in profits in 2009. Exxon not only paid no federal income taxes, 
it actually received a $156 million rebate from the IRS. Over the past five years, while General Electric made $26 billion in profits in the United States, it received a $4.1 billion refund from the IRS. So if you're working stiff, you're making thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. You're paying taxes, but if you're Chevron and you made ten billion in profits in two thousand nine, you don't have to pay any taxes. You get a nineteen million dollar refund. The Powell memo recommended constant surveillance of content in textbooks, newspapers, magazines, radio, and television, insisting that big business use the media to convince Americans that an end to business regulation would somehow benefit us all. For 38 years, the Federal Communications Commission had enforced the Fairness Doctrine, which mandated that all broadcasts over public airwaves offer a balance of viewpoints. In 1987, Ronald Reagan stopped enforcement of the Fairness Doctrine, opening the floodgates for corporate money to talk directly to America through the media. A few years ago, uh, studies were showing that uh, of the 350 uh, top radio markets in the country, you had something like 90% of uh, right-wing talk and less than 10% of progressive talk. Media deregulation is a big story. I think it's a threat to democracy. Most people don't have any idea what's going on. After his 1992 election, Democratic President Bill Clinton continued to implement key elements of both the Powell Memo and the Heritage Foundation's prescriptions for government by and for big business. In 1996, Clinton signed the first major overhaul of telecommunications law in 62 years. People have to understand that now there are just a handful of corporations that own the media and every one of them has an agenda. What Rupert Murdoch thinks is more likely to be what you think than anything else. I think the media is awful. Awful. They don't do in-depth reporting. They distort the news story to show the most confrontational headline. They don't do in-depth news Saddam gathering. Saddam Hussein recently sought Saddam significant, significant quantities, of uranium, quantities of uranium quantities from Africa. uranium. Our intelligence Africa. sources tell us that he has attempted to purchase high strength, high strength, aluminum, aluminum, tubes, tubes, high strength aluminum tubes for nuclear weapons suitable production. For nuclear weapons production. 20 years ago, nobody who was in journalism thought anything of saying to a politician to his face, Senator, stop lying to the Los Angeles Times. General, you know that's not true. I know that's not true. Uh, today, if you said something like that, you'd be fired. You would be fired. We don't ask tough questions. And we have these orchestrated White House press conferences. And Obama is actually worse than his predecessor, George right, Bush, so on that, this issue. Me, all right, so with we'll that, who's on me. the list? We'll see who's on Jake the list. Tapper. We're going to start with Jake Tapper. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. But you don't get the information that you need, and you're pretty much on your own. The same thing that's happened in business has happened in broadcasting. It's just completely profit-driven. U.S. Steel is getting out US of the steel business. Is getting out, getting out of the steel community. business, and they're getting out of this and they're community. Saying, goodbye. We had enough. And saying, no goodbye. More left. We had we enough. The There's no more left. We're going we on to greener the pastures. We're going on to greener pastures. We've seen the acceleration of the hollowing out of America as the most important and powerful industrial society on earth. Since 1973, approximately 40 million good-paying American jobs with benefits have been shipped overseas or dismantled by corporations, boosting their own profits at working Americans' expense. There is this notion that this was only a Republican uh, villainy, when, in fact, uh, much of what happened happened during the eight years of Bill Clinton. We seek a new and more open global trading system, not for its own sake, but for our own sake. I supported NAFTA then, and I supported NAFTA now. I still support NAFTA now for the same reason, or the same reasons. The main one is I, like most economists, generically favor trade liberalization because trade leads to gains on both sides. 
as uh, Jorge Castaneda, who was later finance minister of Mexico, once said, he said, NAFTA was a arrangement between the rich and powerful of all three countries, leaving ordinary people out. What that really means in simple language is that corporations are able to move anywhere in the world they want to, to seek cheap labor and exploit people, and use that as leverage against workers here in the United States. If you States just want to get out of price tax, if you just want to get out of price tax, $13, $14, dollars an hour for factory workers. And you can workers. move your factory south to the border. And you can move your factory south to the border. border. Pay a dollar an hour for your labor. Have no health care. That's the most expensive single element. Have no health care. That's the most expensive single element. Have no environmental controls. No pollution controls. Have no environmental controls. No pollution controls. And no retirement. And you don't care about anything. And you don't care about anything. There will be a giant sucking sound going south. There will be a giant sucking sound going south. And if you look at the statistics since NAFTA, in all three countries, the wages of workers have been stagnant, the productivity of workers has skyrocketed, and workers in all three countries have gone into debt in order to maintain their living standards. We also saw a massive uh, movement toward unfettered free trade. And the theory of that was that if uh, you create trade agreements with China uh, where people are paid 40, 50 cents an hour and you shut down plants in America and you move to China and you move to Mexico, that in some way that we haven't quite figured out yet, uh, this is going to be good for the American worker. For 20 years, the American public believed we could simultaneously outsource all of our jobs and simultaneously maintain our quality of life at home. We thought we could do that. Guess what? No such thing. We can't have our cake and eat it, too. We are eviscerating our manufacturing capability, all in the name of lower prices, all in the name of free trade, all in the name of the market always knows best. The market doesn't know best. Offshoring of employment has been with us for a very long time, but has mostly been restricted to manufacturing. The new wrinkle is offshoring of services, the number and range and variety of jobs that could, in principle, be done abroad, say, over the internet. It's enormous. If you look at it in terms of pure business, they're the right decisions. You go to the lowest labor cost. In terms of, uh, uh, what, what's, what's the right word, patriotism, uh, they're not. It will be painful, and for a number of reasons. One of them is going to be large. Maybe over the course of the next generation, 30, 40 million jobs. It's important to note, this is not either about only low-skilled jobs or only high-skilled jobs. They're all over. If what you do is write computer code, routine computer code, you lose nothing in quality if you move the job from Indiana to India. Paul Craig Roberts, a co-founder of Reaganomics, feels that big business has gone too far. All these ladders are being dismantled. Uh, wh where, where are the jobs for university graduates? They are now beginning to face the same dilemmas that blue collar workers face when they lost their $20 an hour manufacturing jobs with their good benefits. And so we have an economy that is starting to impoverish its workforce. An infinite number of people coming who are taking jobs that pay over 100000 a year. You know, they're going to pay taxes. We create lots of other jobs around those people. You know, my, my basic view is that the country should welcome as many of those people as we can get. And what the corporations are doing, or they tell Congress, oh, there's a shortage of engineers. There's a shortage of scientists. We can't find any. This is all an absolute with total lie. Manager, with the with the Many manager, corporations will go to any lengths, including these legal but deceptive practices, to hire cheaper foreign labor. Look at this video clip recorded at a seminar conducted by an American law firm for human resources professionals. And our goal is clearly not to find a qualified and interested U.S. worker. And, you know, that, in a sense, that sounds funny, uh, but it's what we're trying to do here. I get 50 resumes. My God, this is the last thing I want to do is interview these 50 people. Does the law require that I actually interview each and every candidate? You don't have to interview each and every candidate. If it gets to the point where somebody's looking like they're very qualified, we ask them to have the manager of that 
specific position, step in and go over the qualifications with them. If necessary, schedule an interview, go through the whole process to find a, a legal basis to disqualify them for this particular position. Have you ever talked with displaced workers yourself? Have I ever talked with this? The fact that I'm thinking this means the answer is either no or almost no. I, I, I can't offhand remember uh, a case. You know, we professors tend to be ivory tower types. What they've done for the last 20 years is destroy the ability of people who worked hard and played by the rules to have decent retirements. Big business was not satisfied with just outsourcing jobs and getting huge tax breaks to increase their profits. Corporations also set their sights on eliminating guaranteed pensions. Common stock. Do I own it? Stock. I don't even Do know I what they are. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what they are. Mm -hmm. In the 1950s, stock gets marketed like another consumer item. At the same time, pension funds are starting to change. Why, for example, should a company have to put away that kind of money um, as a liability to pay off its retired workers when instead they could take some out of the paycheck every week and then make you go invest it yourself? So why not put your did. money to work? So why not put your money put to work? Put my money to work. Put my right. money to work. You can right. own a share of American you business. You can own a share of American business. You know, there's a joke that uh, compensation executives tell each other. What's a four-letter word that starts with an F, ends with a K, and stands for screw your workers? 401K. 401Ks are a subtle kind of pay cut, and they're bad economics. Defined benefit pension plans were on top of your salary. And that meant you worked for a company for 30 years or so, you retired, you knew exactly how much money was going to get paid out of the pension because the company kept this pension fund and it kept enough money in it to pay you out. Under a 401k plan, you have to save money out of your paycheck so you have less money. A company may give you a match, but these plans typically save a company 50% or more uh, in the plan. Then you assume all the risks of investing your money. If the average person could manage investments, then why in the world would they pay the gigantic salaries that they do on Wall Street? Today, state governments are beginning to shift public worker pensions to 401k plans. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 million of our citizens. Social security is an incredibly important Benefit. I'm here to support the Social Security benefits that my parents get, and I'm here to support the Social Security benefits that I hope to get and my children hope to get. Social Security is not just a retirement benefit, it's a three-tier benefit, so it helps millions, millions of seniors stay out of poverty and live a decent life in their retirement, but it also helps disabled people. When disabled people need our support as a society, it helps them function, and just as importantly is the survivor benefit so that if working people are killed, unfortunately, in some circumstance, their children will have a source of income. One of the greatest pieces of idiocy ever suggested was privatizing Social Security. Why do it just with pensions? If it works for pensions, take the whole Social Security fund, the one element of the New Deal reform plans that still remains, and put that in the stock market. This had been a goal of the anti-Franklin Roosevelt, anti-New Deal conservatives from the 1930s onwards. It actually came as perilously close to happening as it ever could have under the presidency of George W. Bush. Um, the if you're a younger worker, I believe you should be able to set aside part of that money. So you can build a nest account. egg 
So you can build future. a nest egg for your Here's own why future. the personal accounts are a better deal. Here's why the personal accounts are a your better deal. Your money will grow. Over your time, money will grow at a greater rate than over anything time, the current system at a greater can rate than anything the current system your account can deliver. Will provide money for retirement and over and above will the provide check money you will for retirement from over and above Security. the check you will receive from Social Security. Under Reagan, the mandate agenda included not only deregulation of Main Street industries, but the financial industry as well. This set the scene for a future disaster on a scale previously unimaginable, starting with the hundreds of savings and loan bankruptcies of the late 1980s. The financial razzle-dazzle that 30 years later takes down the economy really starts when Wall Street starts inventing all kinds of new gimmicks, and the regulators give all this stuff a free pass. Everything has rules. You know, baseball has rules right down to how many stitches are on the baseball. And when you remove the rules, you enable people who behave badly. The purpose of rules is not to regulate saints. It is to deal with people who are sinners. Once Wall Street was deregulated, their profits mushroomed. Large commercial banks like Citicorp watched with envy. And in the mid-1990s, they too began fierce lobbying to get their slice of the pie. In 1933, Congress passed a law called the Glass-Steagall Act. And that law said, well, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out if allowing banks to invest in speculative securities brings down the banking system when the market fails, then maybe we shouldn't let them do it. It was very simple. It maintained that commercial banks that were responsible for individuals, deposits, and savings, and lives were kept separate and were backed by the government from the more speculative, risky trading activities of the investment banking community. It worked so well that people forget. And in 1999, a genius by the name of Phil Graham, aided by a brilliant president named Bill Clinton who signed the bill, and pushed by a free market ideology that had been peddled to the United States people since the day Ronald Reagan was elected, said, we don't need Glass-Steagall anymore. We haven't had bank panics. Glass-Steagall was the longest lived and most successful financial law ever passed, protecting consumers and investors alike. Within a year of Glass-Steagall's repeal in 1999, President Clinton signed the deceptively named Commodity Futures Modernization Act, deregulating shadowy financial products known as derivatives. One of those instruments, known as the credit default swap, became the prime culprit in the 2008 worldwide financial crisis. The head of the Federal Reserve Bank at the time, Alan Greenspan, endorsed these changes, giving the green light for Wall Street to once again become a casino was Alan Greenspan, who was an extreme conservative. And there was a period, you know, in the 90s when Greenspan was widely praised as this genius, and he got out just in time. He got out just before the crash, and his policy of deregulating everything and financing all of this speculation with very cheap money, that's going to look a lot worse in light of history than it did uh, at the time. He wanted to give Wall Street really a gift at the time, which was cheaper money, which is why he cut rates. And all the speculators take advantage of the very cheap money, and they invent a whole bunch of new toxic stuff, like subprime. In the last 10 years, something crazy happened. The multiple of the value of housing to people's incomes went through the roof. And that was a classic case of a speculative bubble. And uh, this was engineered uh, on Wall Street. Because there was so much trading, there appeared to be a demand for mortgages, which meant it appeared there was a demand for homes being sold, which inflated the actual cost of homes. There was some sense that, well, maybe, even if it goes down, we won't be the last company holding the ball. Wall Street paid their chief executives hundreds of millions of dollars for screwing us up and losing our money. And we paid them a huge premium for this. We said, boy, these are really smart guys. They're not smart guys. You and I would never have made those loans. Where do you think you made a mistake then? I made a mistake in presuming 
that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such as that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders and the equity in the firms. The consequences of this mistake are huge. Again, it wasn't accidental. This wasn't just random delusion. It was prevalent because so many people were making so much money. As soon as the casino goes bust, they want government to bail them out. Now, that's not a free market. That's uh, socialism on the uh, downside and capitalism on the upside. If Greenspan and Rubin had really believed the ideology that they preached, they would not have bailed out the SNLs the way that Greenspan did. They would not have, Rubin would not have bailed out the, the uh, Wall Street holders of Mexican bonds in 1995. Greenspan would not have bailed out the stock market in 2000 and 2001. The only explanation I can have for this is that it's a class question. These people were protecting their class. Wall Street and the wealthiest 1% now tell us that government is running out of money. They want us to believe that Social Security and Medicare cuts are needed, that the eligibility age for Social Security should be increased to 70. Permit me to start with one number. Permit me to start with one number. $53 trillion dollars in today's dollars. $53 trillion is what the country in owes. Dollars. Is what the country <laughs> between owes. Our future between our future liabilities, between our future and our liabilities, unfunded promises. Debt for programs like Social Security and promises. Medicare. For programs like Social Security and Medicare. Pete Peterson and the Concord Coalition come in and say, oh my God, we've got these enormous deficits. And instead of focusing on the cause of the deficits, which are the Reagan and the Bush tax cuts, they then say we have to take an ax to all of these middle class entitlement programs. Peter G. Peterson, a multi-billionaire who was one of the founders of Blackstone, which was a private equity company. He gave a billion dollars to set up the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, which hired uh, the former head of the GAO, Government Accountability the Office, a man named David Walker, it's the price we to go around the country and crusade for the idea that what is wrecking the economy is not people like me, Mr. Peterson, but what is wrecking the economy is Social Security. trying to convince these 18 people that Social Security is solvent. It is not uh, affecting the debt. It is not the way to solve the debt. The way to solve the debt is to create more jobs. I think we're in a situation now where I, ha where I have to modify my philosophy. Um, a little bit and maybe, maybe a lot. I'm just being totally honest. The guy comes up and says, I'm gonna do away with Medicare. I will campaign against him like you have never seen because I'm a beneficiary of Medicare. The guy who wants to get rid of Social Security. I put a whole lot of money into Social Security. I want mine back. And I'll tell you what I think. Uh, and I may be going out on a limb on this, uh, but I think that the Obama administration is very worried about what we call a capital strike, a strike of capital, in the sense that if you really push these guys too hard, they're going to say, oh, really? You don't want us to get bonuses? You want us to be accountable? You want to know about our illegal behavior? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to freeze up credit completely, and your economy is going to go tank Good luck to you, Mr. President. The big banks can make such threats today because they operate with no fear of criminal penalties. Folks who were in charge of running this economy ran red light after red light after red light and caused car wreck after car wreck after car wreck, and no one's held them accountable. There hasn't even been a conversation about accountability. In 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court, stacked with pro-corporate justices, overturned a conviction won by the Justice Department against accounting firm Arthur Anderson 
implicated in the Enron scandal. Now, incredibly, the government tells companies to police themselves. The Justice Department's current position is that a company can escape criminal prosecution if they just promise to change their behavior. You would think that Congress would say, who caused it? Who are we going to hold accountable? Are people going to jail? Where's the prosecution? You would think that would have happened, right? Hasn't happened. And the banks are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill. Uh, and they, frankly, own the place. As of 2011, not one corporate CEO, bank executive, or politician has been criminally prosecuted for crimes leading to the economic meltdown of 2008. If you really did the investigation, uh, the Democrats would not be able to simply say, oh, it was those, that, that George W. Bush, it was him. Well, you know what? It was a lot of Bush. But I'm afraid the Republicans would be able to say, sorry, not just us. Take a look at Robert Rubin, the Secretary of Treasury under Bill Clinton and all of the Rubin guys. They were working with Alan Greenspan. They were working with Phil Graham to deregulate all of this stuff. So you got true bipartisanship. Everybody wants bipartisanship. You got it. And the memory of Ronald Reagan being enshrined in this country as some kind of a great leader is a crime. Um, the memory of any of the Republican leadership, or, or the Democratic leadership for that matter, over the last 25 years, being as anything other than conspirators in the theft of America, is a crime. We didn't actually clean up Wall Street. We actually didn't slay the beast. <laughs> we actually put them on life support and they've been off healing and mending themselves and doing quite really well. For 30 years, we've been turning up the heat on average Americans slowly. And it's been turned up at such a slow pace that if you say this is a crisis, people look at you as if you're weird. When the majority of the American public can no longer feed their families, we're going to have a crisis. And that's where we're headed. We don't want to see our way of life go away. We don't want to see our standard of living decline dramatically. That's what's at risk. What we've seen over the last 30 years is a deliberate transfer of wealth from middle class and the poor to the very wealthiest people in our country. The game is fundamentally rigged, and the ordinary people who do everything right, who play by the rules, still end up with a short end of the stick. I don't think people have a good understanding of how low incomes are in America from work. One third of jobs in America pay less than $15,000 a year. Now, that includes uh, part-time workers and people with two small jobs. But half make less than 25,000. Three quarters make less than 54,000. 99% make less than $250,000. In reality, working Americans have been pushed to rely on credit to make up for the lack of growth in wages, even as corporate profits skyrocketed. Wages have stagnated since 1973, despite increased worker productivity. Instead, the benefits of Americans' hard work have gone to executives and shareholders. What does the Bible denounce? The Old Testament, the New, and the Koran, all of them denounce again and again and again with a really powerful word, denounce as evil. It is taking from those with less to give to the rich. I don't want to create a country where there is a landed gentry where because you happen to make $5 billion, the next 20 generations of your children will get all the best spots in all the best colleges? Nonsense. That's not what America's about. Instead of a society in which we're struggling together to deal with environmental crisis, to deal with education, to make sure that all of our people have health care, we are a society now in which, which the goal is to be one of those people on top that have tremendous wealth and tremendous power. Everybody was shocked by Hurricane Katrina and by the, 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 you know, these images of 
poor African Americans and other people uh, abandoned, st you know, stuck on rooftops, waving American flags for two, three, four days, holding babies without a drop of water, without the U.S. government, the, the richest country in the world, being able to get them a scrap of food after three, four, five days. People were shocked, and it was shocking. But what nobody wanted to address was, it was the logical, necessary, inevitable outcome of 30 years of public policy that both parties had championed, saying, if you're poor, you're on your own. If you're poor, sink or swim. Uh, it, it, and it's better for you. It's morally right that we won't help you if you're poor. You should pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and if you can't cut it, you should be left to sink or swim. Your wife passes out, she's had a heart attack on the floor. Who do you call? You call the local government, and you expect the local government to do something. Government's not evil. Government is sometimes incompetent. Right? Government is unresponsive. Government isn't held to a, a, a sufficiently tight mandate. But government can do things that private citizens cannot do. Our greatest primary task is to put People Our greatest work. primary task is to put people to work. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it this wisely and courageously. This is no unsolvable problem if we it face it wisely and courageously. courageously. By direct it can be accomplished by the government itself. By direct treating the task by the as government we would itself. treat the emergency of a war. Treating the task as we would treat the emergency of a war. When we did all the great things that we did in this country, we did it as a matter of national security and collective self-interest. So you look at, look at the, the railroads, uh, you look at the interstate highway system, uh, you look at the internet, you look at any of the things that uh, really fundamentally changed the way our economy worked. Uh, it wasn't done uh, fundamentally on a market basis. There are only two kinds of power in America. There's organized money, and there's organized people. One thing is really clear, the powerful corporate interests have had it good for so long, they're not gonna let go without a fight. And I think that we have to be very clear about that and ready to fight back. And I say we fight back with organizing, we fight back with good policy, and we fight back with, with strategies that are about achieving victory. The people who do the work we're not the problem. The problem is the political system that's trying to divide us, the political system that's given tax breaks to the rich and the ultra-rich that they don't damn well need. That's the problem. about and what is and what the hope is in it is that people get to live up to their full potential. You get to create who that is. And to me, that hasn't been lost. What's been lost is the part of the American dream that was this sort of white picket fence, 2.5 kids, and some big SUV in the driveway. We have to recast what that means now to have a much more inclusive dream and vision about what it is to, to be uh, in this country, to making a life in this country. There's an opportunity to reframe the American dream. One of the things that faces Americans is to build something beyond traditional capitalism, beyond traditional socialism, that is American in character, that builds an unbelievable American tradition. having a strong media presence is unquestionable. I mean, we need very powerful, positive media representation. And if we're not getting it from the mainstream media outlets, then we gotta create it ourselves. Some people are hurting their feet or hurting their ankles. We give out like ice packs and stuff. These medical supplies came from all over the country. People donated them, which was like heartwarming. This is a conference station. Essentially we provide warm, dry clothing, 
uh, tents, blankets, umbrellas, tarp, everything to keep everyone comfortable while they're camping out here. Basically, we're getting a lot of donations, and with those donations, we're using that to buy supplies and food for everyone. The question will be asked, and the question will be answered, uh, what kind of species we are. You know, are we locusts? Just, you know, are a curse on the planet? We're busy, we're working, but what we're doing is so heedless and so destructive, we leave nothing but disaster in our wake. Or are we honeybees? You know, honeybees work hard, too but they fit in with the ecosystem and they actually are a blessing on the planet. They're a blessing to all creation because their work actually makes more life possible. Now that's our challenges as a human species to be honeybees.